Hello guys, welcome to today's discussion on the Africa Asia platform. And today the discussion we are having is about minimum tax in Kenya. And the discussion is important because uh, the minimum tax, it's a new sort of tax uh, in the sense that it, was, it just came into effect. There has been quite a bit of pushback on it. And so it's quite an interesting topic to discuss. And we will go through what it's aimed at, how it's supposed to work. And so I will introduce our panelists for the discussion tonight. We have Ndunge Wambua. She's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, she will introduce herself a bit more. And then we have Vincent Umbaka. He is, he is a policy and legislative development consultant in Kenya. He's also a lawyer. And we will be getting their perspectives on the minimum tax. And we'll also be getting uh, to discuss more about like why the push back on it, why the uproar, how is it affecting businesses in Kenya? And also the uh, thing about the minimum tax, it's to also provoke some broad uh, tax administrators, not just in Kenya, but in other African countries who are looking for this sort of tax that they are aiming to get um, more revenue from the loss making uh, businesses. So to begin with, I will have um, Dunge introduce herself, then Ombaka will introduce himself. And then Dunge will go will start by introducing what the tax is about and also like explaining how it works. So Dunge, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Christine. As she said, uh, my name is Dunge Wabuagi Shora. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and I practice as a corporate commercial lawyer, uh, currently working at Denton's Hamilton Harrison and Matthews, Kenya. I uh, interact a lot with tax and uh, corporate disciplines of law, and I'm happy to be here to have this discussion with my tremendously competent colleagues. Thank you so much, Dunge, for that, and we look forward to having this discussion with you. And Ombaka, if you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello, my name is Ombaka Vincent, and uh, I am also an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and I also practice as a policy consultant doing legislative drafting. I'm also very glad to be here and also glad to be with you and Dunge. How about you, Christine? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And so to begin with, um, on the minimum tax, we will try and give like a nice overview of what it is and how it works in the sense of like the structure of it when it was introduced. And because having that background will help to put into perspective why it's causing a bit of pushback. So, Dunge, you could go and start uh, start off the discussion by by discussing a bit more on that. Okay, sure thing. So, um, minimum tax was introduced with an effective date of first January twenty twenty one, which was the beginning of this particular month in twenty twenty one, and it affects businesses across Kenya. And perhaps I'll give an introduction of what the tax on businesses was before this. So historically, um, companies have paid corporation tax at the rate of 30% on their net income. And their net income is their total top line revenue from all their sales and operations, less allowable expenses. And the Income Tax Act has a long list of allowable expenses, but primarily it's any business expense that's incurred within uh, the course of generating business income. And the Act also allows some capital deductions for capital investments made within the, within the company in order to support operations. And so net income used to be the tax base for payment of corporation tax by corporations. And so businesses that may be run as sole proprietorships or transparent, uh, there was a graduated scale on which the net income of the business would be chargeable to tax. But because perhaps of very many uh, businesses in a close position and ending up being in a place where they are not remitting any tax on profits, uh, KRA, or not really KRA, but uh, by way of legislation, uh, the, the parliament introduced a uh, minimum tax, which is meant to ensure that every business in Kenya, regardless of whether or not it's profitable, is remitting some form of tax on its income. 
So income tax is uh, imposed at the rate of 1% of gross turnover. So gross turnover is the ultimate top line item in the financials of any entity. So it's the total revenue made from um, all of the business of the company uh, prior to deduction of any expenses. In most cases, this is a very large sum. And uh, it appears that the primary um, motivation of this new law is to ensure that any person doing business in Kenya, whether profitable or not, pays some form of tax to the government on their income. Yes. So I think, Christine, that's uh, a basic introduction. What the, what the law provides is previously, and as still would be the case, tax on business income is payable quarter, in quarterly installments in the fourth, six, nine, and 12 months of an entity's financial year. And it's payable either on the basis of actual revenue or estimated revenue. And then in the the quarter after the 12th month is what was called um, the final installment where it plays a buck and you settle your balance of taxes. So if you had overpaid, you get a, a credit and if you had underpaid, you pay the balance. With minimum taxes will no longer be the case. So in every quarter, what um, a, com- uh, an ent- a business is expected to do is calculate their installment tax as they otherwise would have. And to the extent that that installment is less than 1% of their total, the total revenue they made in that particular period, they have to pay uh, 1% of their total revenue in lieu of the installment they would have paid under the installment tax regime. Mm-hmm. Um, so, of course, this is of great um, concern to companies that have very low profit margins, as well as... Um, Entities that are starting up and maybe are trying to scale and were happy to be actually making a loss as long as they're able to expand their business. But now all of them will have to, you know, dig into their capital in order to ensure they are paying minimum tax um, every quarter as a minimum. So it seems that the government's efforts to try and tax the income of each and every entity um, have some uh, negative externalities. However, there are certain groups that are exempt from this minimum tax. So if you have exempt income, employment income, income that's already subject to residential rental income, if you are subject to turnover tax, which is actually exactly uh, applied at the exact same rate as minimum tax, if your income is a subject of capital gains tax or if your income is in respect of the extractive sector, which is separately taxed, um, then you're exempt. And recently, the, a law was published adding two more exempt groups. Insurance companies are exempt. It possibly could be because, um, you know, they, are, they make a lot of revenue from premiums paid, but then claims made can easily offset that. So they were able to successfully lobby their way into an exemption. And also um, entities whose the retail price of whose sales are determined by the government are also exempt from this. And this is typically entities in the power sector who have tariffs that are stipulated by a government regulatory authority like EPRA and also the one um, entities involved in sale of you know fuel and petro- petroleum products which are stupid regulated and they have no control over uh, what the retail price for their supplies would be. Yeah. So perhaps I'll allow my colleague Ombaka to discuss um, more about this tax and the impact it has had in the industry unless there are any questions on uh, what I've just spoken about. Okay, uh, Dungia, thanks for that. I think it's a good introduction of like keeping a background of how the tax itself works. And I think the main takeaway that uh, for someone trying to get the simplified uh, way of looking at this is that whether you're making losses, whether you're making uh, profit, you need to pay minimum tax. And the profit side, if you're making profit, you don't have a problem with that, except if you're making a lower level. Actually, you do. Okay. 
Okay. If, if the mm-hmm. tax on your profit is less than 1% of your turnover, then it doesn't matter that you're in a tax profit position, you still pay 1% of your turnover. Okay. And so, so do yeah. you, would you say, anyway, okay, we will, let's go to Mbaka and then I will, I will ask. Oh, oh, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe just one more point mm-hmm. is under the, uh, one thing that's not very clear under the installment uh, tax regime for businesses, uh, the extent that they were tax make, making tax losses in the past and the present, they could carry forward those tax losses. It's unclear whether businesses with many tax losses in the past will be able to carry them forward to set off their minimum tax obligation. So if you carry forward uh, credits from the past, we don't know whether these credits can be used to set off future obligations of minimum tax. And if it's allowed by a strict interpretation of law, whether it will be permitted on KRE's iTax website, because some of these have uh, practical implications. And to the extent that it's um, allowed, uh, can this be considered as prejudicing uh, entities that maybe may begin business this year or began or incorporated last year and did not have the privilege of carrying for our tax losses um, and tax credits. So I, I think there are some questions around that and hopefully regulations will be published under the Act giving more clarity as to how how this minimum tax is applied. Okay. Ombaka, let me ask if you are to put minimum tax in one sentence for a business person. What would you say it is, and how is it? Uh, yeah, I think that that depends. It depends with it depends with which business you're engaged in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, but I think I think just put it in, in one sentence. That a lot depends on uh, what your margins are. What mm-hmm. are your margins? It depends in which which sector you're in, because the sector that you're in determines on whether minimum tax applies to you or or if it doesn't apply to you. And so I think I'll just uh, moving on to just have a few points uh, picking up from where and Dunge has left is that uh, tax is governed by principles. I mean, I mean we are not the first people to to start taxation, so to speak. And whether you you're somebody who believes in secular history or whether part of your history involves religious history, like myself. Anybody who has gone through Sunday school or through any kind of Christian literature may have heard the story of Joseph, for instance, mm-hmm. and what happened when he was in Egypt. And uh, we may want to debate and argue whether that was factual or not, but then there is a basis of tax applied from that particular point. So some four common canons coming up from Adam Smith is, first of all, equality, that we should tax people based on their ability to pay or if tax should be proportionate to their income. Secondly, the issue of certainty, that tax should be clear and predictable. People should not be second-guessing themselves when it comes to how, what their tax liability would look like. Third is convenience, which is normally a double-sided coin. The question is, whose convenience? Are we talking about should tax be convenient to the tax collector or to the taxpayer as much as possible? Try and make it to both. And then the, th- the fourth one is economy that the cost of collecting tax should not be so high because then it starts beating logic in terms of whatever you're doing in terms of tax. So when I look at minimum tax and, 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 and level them and try and analyze based on these canons, I find two of them which come shouting out as there's a problem. The first one is the issue of equity or equality. Because as Nogi had mentioned, the government wants to tax 1% of your gross margin. Now, you will see when I move to my next example, simply put, you must make a profit. If you're going, if corporation tax is going to be applicable to you at the rate of 30%, for 30% to be equivalent to 1% of your gross turnover, your profit after all expenses must be 3.33%. Anything lower than 3.33%, and you will start paying more than 30% in the form of tax. Now, what does that one do? It means, therefore, that the businesses which make a higher profit are not, are not subject to minimum tax, but businesses which make a lower profit are subject to tax. Now, when you start breaking this down into the realities of normal businesses, 
uh, there's somebody called uh, Rene who have come up with a concept. They say the blue ocean strategy. Mm -hmm. And I call loosely, and they say there is the blue ocean and red ocean businesses. Blue ocean businesses would be those businesses which are demand creative. You are operating in a space where you are alone, or there are very few of you, and therefore your profit margins are very high because you can basically determine what profits you want to make. Red Ocean is where everybody else is. People are scrambling, the laws of demand and supply are applying pressure, and therefore you can't sell, you can't set prices the way you want. But if you look at the country the way we are, our country, 40% of our economy is the formal economy. And you find many businesses are operating within the Red Ocean space. Mm -hmm. Where there is such high competition, it is captured. And you find there are many people whom their net profits, even their gross profits, cannot match 3.23% because of where they are based. So that means, essentially, what, what, what is happening here is that smaller businesses or less profitable ventures are being punished. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, investments and businesses which are bigger in nature, like you see Safaricom, if you check their, their returns, their, their interim accounts, books of accounts for the year 2020, despite COVID, they were already at 36% earnings before income and tax. Mm -hmm. So you see for them, if you are struggling to hit 3.33%, Safaricom is already on 36%. So they don't really care about minimum tax. It does not affect them. Banks would be the same. So you see, and the big businesses which are going to be hit, as Lungi has rightly mentioned, they quickly rushed and they got their amendment to get exempted. That would be the petroleum sector, insurance sector. So basically, the remaining of the businesses, and you know, our country is largely consumer sector, consumer driven. So anybody who is selling, and as you will see, I'll, I'll bring an example about that. So I feel this tax is going to mean that if you're making lower profits, and those are people within the Red Ocean, they are the majority. They are the people who you have a neighbor you are trying to compete with. They are going to end up paying tax at exorbitant rates. And the worst case scenario, there are people who will have no income. Mm -hmm. You have no profit. Because if you sell at a loss, and I take away 1% of your tax, you pay you three installments, it basically means whatever, you didn't work for anything, you are being taxed at over 100%. Mm -hmm. The second thing is certainty. For the longest time, we've known that tax is 30%, corporate tax is levied at 30% of your net income. But right now, it means tax is, when you are below 3.33%, your tax is anything between 31% to 100. Mm -hmm. so it means people cannot organize their affairs. So either you're telling the people in these businesses to find a way of raising and necessarily raising their, their margins. But then let's look at that in terms of the impact on businesses. And I use an example of uh, somebody whom I like to call Wanjiko. And let's say Wanjiko has a gross turnover of, a hand of 1 million. Just to help her understand. If she has no expenses, her corporate uh, tax will be 300,000. Her minimum tax is 10,000. I mean, that, that looks well. She will not be subject to minimum tax. But the question which I want to ask you is, which business is this Wanjiko is going to do where she can get 1 million Kenya shillings with no expenses? Now, let me break it down to somewhere near where the people who are complaining. If you look at our GDP categorization, number one is manufacturing. I forget what number two is, but number three and number four interchangeably is normally wholesale and retail distribution. In our GDP, surprisingly, even Safari falls at number 10, 9, 10, telecom. That's where telecoms are in terms of our, our GDP. So a majority of our production is operating within the people who are wholesalers. Now, if Wanjiko is a wholesaler and maybe she's a wholesaler of Unga Limited, of course, I can talk about them with confidence because I have their price list at hand. And she has a gross profit of 3% on sales. That is a gross profit before she talks about any expenses. Therefore, it means her profit is 31,000 shillings. Her corporate tax would be 9,500 shillings. But minimum tax is still 10,000. In this case, the law will pick her minimum tax. In any way, she will have paid it. Remember, by 1st of April, the month of 20th of April, she will have done the first installment in the second quarter, in the third quarter, and the fourth one. Now, let's make it more realistic. Supposing Wanjiko, and definitely, for you to be able, for her to be able to sell 1 million shillings worth of extra, 
That is 600 bales. Each bale weighs 124 kilograms. So we're talking about 15 men now. You cannot, you cannot Bluetooth 15 metric tons of flour to your customers. You have to transport them. Mm-hmm. So 15 tons, a lorry must be involved. If I was to give a very modest figure, and, and I'll be honest, that's very modest because for 10,000 Kenya shillings, which is like $100, you are moving goods at a distance of not less than 10 kilometers mm-hmm. using a truck. If you can get that price, that is. So if she was to be able to do that at that price, it means her corporate tax is 5,000 Kenya shillings. But minimum tax is still 10,000, which means she is going to be paying tax at the rate of 53%. Now let's move it to another level. What if she sells at a loss, which happens a lot for the people in trade? You made a bad deal, prices went down, but prices keep on changing. So when prices go low and you already have stock which you paid for, you sometimes have no option to free up your capital, you must sell. So if she sells at a loss, she is still liable to minimum tax. That is saying that minimum tax makes some people start paying 31%, 32%, 53%, 100%, because if you're paying 100% tax, basically you're a state corporation. You have stopped being a business. You're working and then everything you're working for goes to government. The only people whom that happens for is are people who are state corporations. What about the legal implications? Um, some of the legal issues to explore about minimum tax, in my opinion, is first of all, in our constitution, the concept of the canon of equality is enshrined, where we are saying that the burden of tax will be shared fairly. So it means, and making sure that those who earn more pay more, those who earn less pay less. Mm-hmm. So on the, on the outlook, first of all, it means minimum tax becomes aggressive because you are targeting the people who are going to be burdened the most are not people who are having proper investments and all that and the time and the money. It is the smaller people who are struggling to pay tax as is right now who are going to be having a bigger burden happening on them. The, the second issue which is worth exploring, there's one exemption. The exemption was targeting people in the petroleum sector and ensure particularly the one for people whose prices are regulated. Now, we have an act in this country which is hardly ever used. It's called the Price Control Essential Goods Act. The only time it was ever used was in 2017 when the price of maize flour was skyrocketing and therefore the government passed an order to bring it down. So the question then can be, are people who are dealing in essentials, can they stretch that to say that to some extent their sector is actually susceptible to regulation? That may be a long stretch. The third issue is, of course, right to property. If the government is going to come and sweep out all your profits, I mean, are we becoming a communist country? And where is the notice? So the, the question is, if profit is part of my property, when the government decides to take away all my my money, who is compensating me? And second, I know sometimes people say that, you know, where there are tax credits, you can get refunds, that may be a gray area. But there's something here. Somebody has worked. This is the actual money they have gotten, and it costs to have this money. Kenya Revenue Authority takes away this money and stays with it for one year. At the end of the year, if I sold at a loss, I'm having a bigger loss. And you're telling me you're going to give me a refund. Will it come with interest? Because you've taken my money. And so when you look at this, I think in that particular situation, I think it brings the, the issue and the outcry related to minimum tax. The fact that you're having people who are looking at the risk of paying tax at such high rates. Of course, there's the question of what can people do? Uh, there are actually four points. Number one, we can raise our, people can raise their profit margins to try and match compliance. What will that mean? Let me take the example of, of, of Wanjiko being a distributor. As I told you, she has a gross margin of 3%. If you work at her expenses, they cost another 3%. So it means for Wanjiko to be compliant, everything she's selling must have a gross profit of a gross margin of at least six to seven percent. But then there's a problem. She is not alone in the market. Mm. And secondly, the only reason why she is able, she is uh, afraid of this minimum tax issue is because she files tax returns. Mm. And there are so many other people who are either at the same level of, as, as Wanjiko or slightly lower who don't file tax. They don't file VAT. And you see, if, if you do not file VAT, TRA does not have a basis for imposing minimum tax on you. Of course, somebody can say, yes, they can come, they can audit, they never do. 
In fact, I think one of the reasons why minimum tax is so attractive is because it's a very lazy system to administer. All I have to do is to wait for you to file your VAT. Once you file your VAT, I just click and calculate 1%. I can even do a calculator just on my phone and tell you, your turnover was 100 million. Oh yeah, what you have filed. So just give me 1%. It is so easy, it is so lazy to enforce, and before you know it, there will be demand letters being sent on email, as they're being sent nowadays. All people's emails will be like, yeah, send us. But then you see, there is somebody else who is a mini wholesaler somewhere, or a shop somewhere, and they don't file. So for the manufacturer, what would be the easiest thing to do? The easiest thing to do will be to bypass Wanjiko, who is having tax problems, and go to that person who is not filing tax. <laughs> Basically meaning Wanjiko will be out of business. Either that, or even if it was possible for KRA to bring everybody, it means the cost of product is going to be having a rise of between 3 to 10% of essential goods. So then we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for that impact? Because we're telling one to fine, don't sell at a margin of 3%, sell at 7%. So she's selling at 7%. It means at the end of the day, even if we were targeting Wanjiko, the person you are going to have the most is not Wanjiko herself, but the end consumer. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about people who are dealing with essentials. And just to bring it closer home, I like asking this question. For people who are in, in Kenya, because I know this call is international, if you've not eaten a wheat or maize product in the last one week, maybe if you raise your hand or give a reaction, <laughs> most likely there is nobody who has not eaten anything made from wheat or maize. If you do the math, 40% of what people sell in retail, 40 to 50% is maize and wheat sales. So it means you are essentially taking 40 or 50% of the number four GDP in Kenya and throwing them into jeopardy. That's what you're doing. Um, so number one, of course, you can try and comply. You can raise your profit margins. Make sure you're making a gross profit of 7% and above. You'll be okay. Number two, you can plead with the Kenya Revenue Authority. They are the ones enforcing this. It, it is the fastest route to fix this issue because the same way they told Parliament to pass this law, they can tell Parliament not to pass it or they can choose to drag their feet in implementation. That is an option. How successful it like to be, I'm not very sure. Number three, you can petition Parliament. A good example is the way people in the oil and insurance industry, they went, uh, did whatever they did, lobbied the Parliament, and by November, they already were out. But then my question to them even is this. If you look at our GDP again, oh, I remember, number one is agriculture, number two is manufacturing, number three is transport and logistics, number four is wholesale and retail. Now, wholesale and retail and logistics, they go hand in hand in agriculture. So if you're exempting the people in the oil sector from this minimum tax and you want to kill the number four, who is going to fuel these vehicles? Who is going to fuel vehicles? And who is going to get insurance? Because if you look at our insurance, which insurance is being taken up? A lot of insurance is insurance on loans, insurance on motor vehicles. So if you're killing the people who are getting the transport and using this good for me, I find it full hard. In fact, I think it is nonsensical for people in the in, in, in the oil industry to go and lobby for themselves and forget that they actually are leaving their customers out in the cold. So, and then uh, I think I would uh, stop at that in terms of uh, oh, the, the the last thing which can be done is a lawsuit can be filed. And that based on the issues which are raised, which are the legal issues raised before, in terms of is this constitutional with regard to equality, equity in taxation? Is is this tax meeting that particular threshold? So that's my short uh, presentation about this. Over to you, Christian. Okay, thanks so much, Ombaka. I think you have raised such, uh, you know, like the main, you've summarized the discussion very well on what the real issue is with minimum tax. And especially when you bring into perspective what it's likely to do for the essential goods and the impact it will actually have on consumers, you know, because businesses are not in the line of making losses and paying tax to the government. If there's a cost to be borne, they'll pass it on to consumers, you know. So that really is going to affect the cost of living, you know, and even the ability to even access to buy food for consumers and such things so it's it's almost like a, a bigger issue than a business issue it goes very much even to affecting the citizens of kenya in in every single way and Dunge, i don't know what what are your thoughts 
on this, especially when you consider like the principles of taxation and how and how the minimum tax uh, is going against these principles. What are your thoughts on that? And what generally what Ombaka is saying? Okay. I share a lot of Ombaka's sentiments and concerns. I think of one particular issue for me, I, whereas I'm not completely opposed to the tax, I think that where companies are in a profit, uh, tax profit position, uh, regardless of whether or not it, the tax payable is more than minimum tax, they should just be allowed to pay tax on the basis of their, de- their declared tax profit. This will take care of businesses that have low profit margins, which I guess are very many. And then I also think that for those in a tax loss position, the law should be at least be amended to... Uh, I think the mischief the government is trying to curb entities, the mischief of entities who you know will operate for 20, 25 years, they are constantly in a tax loss position, but the company is profitable enough to issue dividends and somehow they are able to tweak their accounts to make sure they never pay corporation tax or other taxes on their or um, other income taxes. And I think that one way of dealing with that is maybe having grace periods of maybe five uh, years from the date of registration where uh, a company can be, you know, exempt from this minimum tax regime because or a business because typically businesses in their initial year is probably you no know, teething issues and a tax loss would be a very reasonable thing to expect. And having this minimum tax, as Ombaka said, is just punishing them unnecessarily. And I think uh, one must also consider that, you know, sometimes people have bad years. I mean, in this COVID period, things have been so bad for businesses that, you know, they've laid off staff, entities have issued profit warnings, and you can imagine that the tax collector will still want uh, come to their coffers under this law and say, give us 1% of your revenue, despite the fact that you you know, you're know you struggling to stay in operation. So I think um, if they want to retain this minimum tax to curb the, the mischief of long-term tax avoidance, then they need to make exceptions for growing businesses and and give people even like two to three three year windows when they can have they can be in a tax loss position and not be liable to minimum tax because they were genuinely uh, making losses due to economic conditions um but there could be a place for a tax like this to um catch perpetual avoid avoiders i agree with ombaka that maybe you uh, are one way of challenging this law uh, would be by way of uh, litigation. But I, I think it's also very pragmatically difficult to litigate against uh, legislation because, you know, there's separation, there's separation of powers. So if, uh, unless it can be proved that this law is unconstitutional, either because, uh, you know, it's uh, it's inequitable and it's not, um, it's un- unfairly depriving people of, of their property, it's, it's, I think it's very difficult to challenge. Um, but maybe uh, we, there's, there's reason to have lobby efforts to just make it a bit fairer and to tweak the law so that um, it doesn't stifle business or and, uh, raise consumer prices because it's being, uh, you know, applied almost like a, a tax on consumption and a tax on the top line. Okay. Don't get those are very good comments. And that's if you have oh, sorry, any- Christine, I have okay. I have just I have actually one more comment. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that may be problematic with this tax is because it's applied on actual revenue and we know that in Kenya we use international accounting standards with accrual accounting, revenue considers projected revenue from sales made even where money has not been collected from the sale. So there, I also foresee problems in cases where entities are making heavy credit sales and may never collect or may look uh, collect so far in the future that they're having to pay um, minimum tax on revenue immediately. It's lodged in their books as a receivable is may distort their cash flows. Mm. Yeah, that, that's actually a good I, point. I think, Christine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me just come in a bit. And I, I do agree with the that, yeah, it's important for us to find means and ways of dealing with the 
people who have been in perennial tax and in the perennial tax loss position. However, even with that, I think even with that, then it should be because remember the law is a very very the law is something that puts the government, which has got time and money and resources and force, against citizens, and therefore any law which is giving the government certain levels of power must be approached with a lot of care because any application quickly, it quickly takes away. First of all, in any case, any law being drafted is a denial of liberty, any law. And the moment you go to an extent where you are presuming that if somebody is making, declaring a loss, then most likely there is something they are hiding. Before we even get to demanding a 1% minimum tax, there are so many steps we'll have skipped. Because even if you're saying people are tweaking their books, if at all they are giving you actual allowable expenses, then by all means, can Kenya Revenue Authority and whoever and the Law Reform Commission just do good work, other jurisdictions are doing it, to make sure that if the law is giving people an exclusion which is should not be allowable, then by all means, take it back. But you see, you can't come up and say that because people are avoiding tax, therefore let me find a blanket way of sorting out my issues. No, we can't allow laziness. Because there is a very lazy option in terms of a government where you're saying, I suspect some people are, are evading tax. Who are these people? If they are not faking receipts, if their expenses are actual, because you know you cannot create a rule that in Kenya you must only do a business that is going to be profitable. By all means. You can't have such a rule because in business, anything can go left. Mm -hmm. In fact, first of all, let me ask this question. There are government entities like Mumias, like DOC Kenya, which have been a lost position for years. I think they should first of all start with the lost making entity called the government. You as government, running your own institutions, KCC. You've been running so many enterprises which are in receivership mode for years and years and years. What moral authority do you have to demand that the private sector must make a profit? Mm. So I'm just saying, even if we were to allow it, there has to be an environment where you are telling people, if you're making loss for five years, then you show cause. Mm. We will have to examine you We'll have to audit you. And if we are not convinced, then we are going to impose 1% tax on you. But surely, because there are people whose business have taken 15 years to pick up, 10 years to pick up. So are you going to punish them? Hmm. Okay. Those are, yeah. wow. Ombaka, I think those are very uh, good thoughts on that. Ombaka, Dunge, mm -hmm. Dunge, go. Uh, Thanks, Ombaka. Thanks, Ombaka. I agree. Okay. And I think that's like one of the issues that the Kenya Manufacturers Association is speaking and saying like applying the tax to just everyone without any sort of like looking through what is the issue that you're trying to address, what's the mischief and looking at whether the tax is meeting that mischief, then I think that's where the problem comes. So guys, if you have questions, I'll, uh, please type them on the chat uh, so that we, uh, we have Ndunge and Ombaka address them. But then as we go on, I would like to hear, Mbaka, what are your thoughts, especially now that you see there are principles of taxation, like Africa, Kenya are not the only countries in the world that have come up with tax as a mechanism of raising revenue for government. But I think there's a situation where governments, because they have the power and they have the, the right also to collect uh, tax, and if you look at the parliament in Kenya, like the justification for minimum tax, they say that the companies that are making and or businesses that are making losses are enjoying public utilities. They are enjoying roads that have been uh, that have been constructed. They are enjoying electricity. They are enjoying the protection of the government. Even if the question about how much protection businesses are getting in Kenya might be debated, but what the government was reasoning is that they are using public resources for which they are not contributing to. So the government's reasoning was let's have Loss making businesses contribute to public utilities. But that reasoning is okay because it's one of the theories that are submitted for taxation. But if you are to rethink tax that's being levied within Africa or Baka, 
like what are some of the things that you look at and say let's let's rethink this let's rethink the approach that the governments are using not just in Kenya because you'll find like the other thing is that minimum tax may look very appealing to Tanzania and Tanzania may just decide to borrow some of these things from Kenya but if you are to speak to the tax administrations within Africa on how to rethink this approach that's being taken on raising revenue in Africa, what are some of the thoughts that you'd have on that? First of all, I want to start by asking, where is the data? You see, we, we are being told that there are people who are avoiding tax. Who are they? How many are they? How much tax are we expecting to collect from this particular enforcement we're talking about? Because I, I feel like we make statements are made but information is very difficult to come by in this country. So I have to ask myself, if somebody is telling me that there are businesses that are avoiding tax because and they're declaring a loss for 20 years, where are they? Because as far as I'm concerned, the only business I know which are declaring losses are government entities mm -hmm. and state corporations. They are the ones which year in, year out, they are declaring losses if their business is their profit making. And if they are not profit making, they are having budget deficit. It's just a loss. You see, if you're a state corporation, which is not a profit-making entity, but your responsibility is to give a service and you're always having a budget deficit, it means you're a loss-making entity. So where is that data? That one for me, I think, is very important. And secondly, who are the stakeholders who are consulted when these things are being done? Because I, I, I always wonder, where are they? Because if CAM is protesting, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers is protesting. If ICPSK is protesting, if ICS is protesting, if LSK is protesting. So I have to ask myself, if you didn't consult the lawyers, you didn't consult the accountants, you didn't consult those in corporate governance, you didn't consult the manufacturers. So who did you consult? Who are your stakeholders? Because if these are the major and the most organized stakeholders in this country, I am left wondering how that is being done. But beyond that, I would say are three things that need to be done in terms of, of moving forward in tax in Africa. Okay. One, there is the concept of responsive regulation. Mm -hmm. We need to view people and citizens of the various countries as partners in regulation. You know, regulation is like medicine. You need the cooperation of the regulated and the regulator for things to work well. We need to stop behaving as if the revenue collectors are implementing this thing for somebody else's purpose apart from the people they are governing. Well, sadly, in Kenya, it may be true. Maybe you are trying to make sure you can pay your debts. So maybe is it that the main stakeholder who is being consulted are those whom we owe? Because like in Kenya right now, the number one budget item is debt repayment. So could it be that our debtors are busy proposing things they can't do back at home because they just want their money from us? So. Let us start enforcing responsive regulation. We need to make sure we forge better cooperation with people. Secondly, we need to have real capacity building. In Kenya, just to give an example, capacity building is where the Kenya Revenue Authority calls you for a calls you for a monologue. They call you and they tell you we are having minimum tax. Yeah, go sort yourselves out. Pay if you don't pay, we'll come for you. Now that is not capacity building. We are having 46% of our economy being informal. You can't expect somebody who is a mechanic, who is earning income on a daily basis, to start gathering that income and go look for an accountant. So we need to work backwards and find a way of working with these professional bodies so that we can have some real capacity buildings. Analyze capacity gaps. Revenue authorities must stop punishing success. Because some of these people are in business, they were just buying and selling and buying and selling, and before they knew it, they were having a turn of a million dollars. So revenue authorities wait until you are having a turn of a million dollars, and then they start reminding you the mistakes you've done over the last 10 years. Where were they when you were starting? And then finally, we need to rethink revenue raising in Africa. We are having state corporations doing very well. I mean, look at Norway. They're having Start Oil. They're having a sovereign wealth fund which is able to invest and get dividends for the country. We need to look at service provision. Take an example of Kenya. When you put up a good train to one of the to the coast, people are able to pay. So can we do the same for hospitals? Can we do the same for schools? Thirdly, can we introduce things like convenience charges? If you are going, if you want to apply for a visa in the UK from Kenya, it takes 15 days, and you'll pay 150 dollars. But if you want your visa in two days, you'll pay 350 dollars. Can we have those? 
can we fill in those gaps? Because in our jurisdictions, when you want your passport in two days, you pay a bribe. What if we just put a surcharge to that? Because if it is possible to get a passport in one hour, just make it expensive. Mm. So we need to rethink how we are raising revenue in Africa. Those are very good thoughts and ideas that you're sharing. And Dunke, I don't know what your thoughts are, especially on rethinking uh, like revenue raising in Africa. What are your thoughts on that? I think, in fact, I have little to add to Ombaka's ideas. I think the African governments need to be a lot more creative on their their sources of income, and rather than have you know taxes like this, which um don't uh, give give consideration to economic and commercial realities of how businesses work, they need to be they could improve by being more innovative about how they collect tax. So they are actually taxing the people who have who you know have can comfortably pay the taxes or are already expending those amounts, but uh, they're going to private coffers, like as Ombaka said, with people, you know, bribing state officers and that money could have gone to the state. Similar, like, even in the police force, you know, they can introduce spot fines, right? Instead of people paying money to policemen, they can pay a fine on the spot and that money goes to the government exchequer rather than in than to private pockets of corrupt uh, government officials and or compromisable uh, government officials. So there's so uh, there's a lot to be considered in that regard and in terms of innovation and just trying to maintain. Uh, Ombaka I think opened by talking about the canons of taxation, one of which is equity, and equity should be horizontal and vertical. And vertical equity means those who you know, are able to have more income or are spend, consuming more, pay a larger proportion of tax because it bites them less and they they have a larger base on which to pay their taxes. So if the government could find ways of taxing them instead of, you know, overtaxing industries which produce basic supplies that every monarchy, every common man consumes, I think it would be a lot better for a more equitable society and even a more robust exchequer. And I think those are very good observations that Ndugi and Ombaka you make, and especially with the like the digital economy, like one of the big concerns that's noted for Africa and why Africa is more likely to lose with businesses going online and with the digital platforms is because the biggest source of, uh, or one of the biggest source of revenue for governments on the tax side is corporate tax. So African governments tend to rely a lot on tax revenue to fund the government, to fund, uh, to finance, uh, government operations. And this is whether it's customs or whether it's corporate tax, instead of looking at these other possible ways of raising revenue. So it's like the digital economy, which African governments are really struggling to, like, uh, figure out like how do we tax Facebook, for instance, or Twitter for the income that they are earning in these countries, and so it's observed like by the OECD, by the Africa Tax Administ- Administrative Forum, that one of the big challenges that Africa is going to face is because of over reliance on tax revenue to fund the government. So as the revenue is decreasing because of not having the ability to tax these platforms. The African governments now turn to more either foreign aid, looking for aid, or relying on other ways of like increasing taxes on areas that they shouldn't be, you know, like overtaxing in. So it's quite a concern, and I think those are very good thoughts that you're having. But Ombaka, if you have any other thoughts on the topic, uh, you could share them, and then Dunge, and then we have if we have no more questions. Uh, we will end the session. I hope there was a lot to learn about what is the issue to a minimum tax. I think I can go first and just uh, in closing say that yeah. I agree with you mm-hmm. that uh, we are, there is great need for Africans and African governments to become creative, to invest in thinking and, and really, really take the issue of the future seriously because you've mentioned a lot is changing. Like, as you mentioned, right now, advertisement revenue is going to YouTube and we can't tax YouTube. In Kenya, things that people like Uber are taking 25% of the tax revenue, uh, so to speak, because in, in Nairobi right now, if you're not in Uber, you can't do taxi business. 
So and, and people are struggling how to tax them. Of course, they're talking about a digital tax, but how do you enforce those taxes? And are you going to get into a rat hole like Uganda where you struggle to find a way of taxing Facebook and at the end of the day you start taxing your own uh, citizens? So I think it's important for us to rethink whatever we are doing and not always fall back to injuring the people who are helping you stand. I think it's a very wrong thing by our government. Thank you. Okay. Dunge, if you have any other thoughts on this. I think Ombaka uh, raised an important point that we now have this new digital service tax, but enforcement may be difficult. I think um, one way they could enforce is by requiring um, all these online platforms which have payments to to show, to reflect the tax element in, in the invoice, kind of like, you know, shopping on Amazon abroad and how you see the tax element before you can even go to checkout. And then they're able to catch non compliant people by just going to the sites and uh, seeing instances where the tax element is not included in the total invoice. But I guess it becomes more difficult where certain services like you know, Facebook for consumers uh, may be free. So, like, just following through to to ensure that income attributable to Kenyan operations is subjected to this tax is very is difficult. Yeah, and one general comment on this approach of you know tax uh, of of the government uh, that involves taxing businesses uh, that produce essentials and then which have which adjust to this these taxes by increasing their prices and hence um, increasing the price of uh, consumer goods it's self-defeating in some senses because um, from an economic perspective when prices go up demand goes lower if demand is lower businesses are selling less making less revenue which means the government is collecting less so uh, it makes more sense uh, instead for them to just have a fair tax system that encourages business and encourages investment, and that way there'll be a larger base for them to collect from, even if they're collecting less. They are somehow able to, you know, scale and uh, bring in more people into the pool and just, you know, tax them uh, equitably. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks, Dunge. And I think those are very good comments that you make, especially on the in the long run, the government may stand to lose more by this minimum tax than it stands to gain, you know. And I would go back to like what Obaka was saying, like the principles on which tax is imposed, they have been there, started from uh, Adam Smith, uh, from the world of the nations, and there have been principles that have been tried and tested. So I think they work. And so, I, so when minimum tax and how the government is going about imposing tax seems to be problematic for the very business environment that it's operating, then it's self-defeating for the government. But it, it's quite a question and things to consider even on public participation, which is like a requirement in the constitution when the decision is being passed, there should be public participation. If the main sectors, like Kambaka said, were not consulted, then how was public participation part of the process of passing minimum tax in Kenya? But quite a lot to think about on the minimum tax. but Thank you very much, Dunge. Thank you very much, Ombaka, for the insights that you've shared. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot that someone can think about. And for business people who have been listening to this, and we'll share the recording on, on podcast, on YouTube, and other platforms. When, once you listen to this, if you, have, uh, if you have questions, you can raise them and comment about it. But the minimum tax, like the outcome of it, is something to look out for when the Kenya Manufacturers Association. Uh, when they go to court or whatever approach is taken to resolve this, we will possibly have another discussion to update and see what has happened about it and yeah, what are the lessons they are to learn. So thanks everyone for tuning in and listening in and thank you Ndunge, thank you Ombaka. It has been a very insightful discussion.